Welcome to the fourth module of Future Us, a roadmap to elder abuse prevention. My name is Benedict Shufflin. I am the executive director of the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse. On March 24, 2022, CNPA released Future Us, a roadmap to elder abuse prevention. You can access it at futureus.cnpa.ca in French and in English. We kicked off a series of five modules hosted by the National Initiative for the Care of the Elderly with an overview of Future Us. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome Laura Tumblin Watts, President and CEO of CanAge, who will elaborate on the policy component of Future Us. This module will highlight priorities and opportunities in policy for addressing elder abuse. We hope you will watch our full series addressing research, practice, and the law to address elder abuse in Canada. It is now my pleasure to pass the mic to Laura Pemblin Watts. Thanks so much, Benedict. It's a real pleasure to talk to you today a little bit about how policymakers can make substantive change around this roadmap. And I myself have been on many different sides of policy making. So this is not just going to be a high level, but this will be practical as well. And I hope it will be useful for you, whether you're in government, an organization, a regulator, a business, or a person who's interested in trying to figure out how to move this policy agenda forward. The roadmap to elder abuse prevention, of course, has been a guiding spotlight in how we are thinking about abuse and neglect prevention and response across this country. And with the release of this roadmap provides actionable steps for what we can do across Canada to take their abuse and neglect to the next level in terms of policy engagement and embedding. Just a refact, you'll remember we talk about the starting our journey. We talked about the guides that we can take to move us in the direction. We're of course sharing how you can contribute and really that's going to be a big piece about what we talk today. I'm gonna to flag a little bit of the big picture. So I hope today will be quite a practical set of steps. In the roadmap, we talk about citizens and organizations, communities and government and how each can play a role. But of course, policymakers exist within each. And I want to just take a minute to talk about how the roadmap was created because it helps us think practically about which policymakers from each of these citizens, organizations, communities, and government were involved. You'll see here a lovely collection of organizations from diverse backgrounds, academic institutions, community-based organizations, and on the advisory committee, you'll also see individuals who were bringing a stream of different perspectives to this conversation. That's important because when you as a policymaker, again, as an individual, as a community member, as a member of government, are trying to express how much buy-in and support there was and how it was constructed. It's going to be important to remember in this context that the consultations were consensus building, bilingual, pan-Canadian, and from a wide diversity of organizations. Let's take it to the next step of what we're really going to talk and focus on today. The question is, how can a policymaker effectively scope this problem. So what I mean by that is, how do you figure out from your point of view where your piece of it is? How can you understand that broad spectrum? But maybe you're coming from a health mandate or maybe you're coming from a law mandate. Maybe you work at a community-based organization or maybe you're a regulator of a financial sector. How can you figure out where your slice of that, where your scoping of your mandate intersects with this roadmap? We're going to talk a little bit about integrating into existing priorities and some skills around trying to make sure that you have thought through, again, what your mandate and your priorities already are so that you can come to this conversation from an asset point of view, which means you already know what you've got and you already know where you're supposed to get to. You could feed this work into that without trying to create an entirely new mandate or an entirely new strategy. And building on that, we're going to be looking at some ways in which you can identify opportunities and get some wins 
We all know that in the world of policy, you can have very long-term goals, and those sometimes can take a decade or more. But there are also some ripe opportunities right now that if you can make the connection between the work that you're already doing and that for which your strategic plan or your mandate has called out for, you may be able to adopt some of those pieces early on into that. So we'll talk a little bit about how to landscape those opportunities and plan out together what some of those wins are. Oh, policy is a big word. It can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. So I wanted to take a minute by talking about who I'm thinking about when I'm thinking of policymaker. Yes, of course, it can be a government person, but it can also be someone from a professional association. It could be somebody from a regulator or a person who's running a company or even a series of companies. It's a person who could be running a not-for-profit or civil society organization. We could be thinking about people who are lawyers, people who are insurers. It's anyone who has the pen. And that could mean that you're a person who works at a hospital, or it could mean that you're a social worker involved in creating systems and structures for your local community-based organization. If you've got the proverbial pen and you have an opportunity to provide input, this is the session for you. That makes you a policymaker. When we're thinking about what a policy is, I'm talking about a course of action, which is driving decision making. And in particular, it's about setting key priorities. We're going to talk more about those priorities and how your existing priorities can map onto these ones in the roadmap. Of course, policies and resources go together. Now, when we're thinking about resources, again, in that policy world, let's chunk those out. Is it that you're a funder and that you have money that you can allocate? Great, that's wonderful. We need lots more of you. Is it that you can um, provide some expertise, some time, some support in other ways? Can you help leverage with social media assets? Can you bring together into the conversations you're holding either as meetings or roundtables? Or can you invite someone as speaker to, to come from the folks who are helping to develop the roadmap into your organization and explain it? So again, resources can be money, it could be time, it could be exposure. I think a policy is really a creative process and that is where it gets really exciting. So we're trying to figure out a course of action to take. And in this very narrow piece, we're thinking about what are the pieces that we can do to bring the roadmap and enliven it into your world so that you can carve out actionable steps. A good policy is informed by evidence, and you see that I put hopefully behind it. One of the challenges we have in elder abuse and neglect is that our evidence is mixed. We have some that's very good and solid, and we have an evolving set of evidence where we're not really sure necessarily what interventions actually work. So when I'm saying informed by evidence, we do know a lot. We'll talk a little bit about what we do know, and it's in the roadmap too. But what we don't know is perhaps as important. And that can be an opportunity as well. So again, I hope that you're looking at yourself as a policymaker, maybe not just by your job, but also by your volunteerism, by your passion area, by your commitment to your community. Or maybe you're a person who hasn't played that role before, but you're thinking to yourself, maybe I might like to get involved in actually trying to move this agenda forward at a systems level, as opposed to trying to help one-on-one. -on -one. Sorry. I think of a successful policy as one that you can bring top of mind to really all of the meetings and conversations that you're having. We do this in some cases by asking people to put a senior's lens on, think of it as a pair of glasses. We do this already with gender, and we do this with environmental issues, and sometimes other issues as well, like disability or inclusion. If we can bring a senior's lens, and even more specifically an elder abuse lens, to all of the working that policymakers are doing, 
that you always remember to ask those questions. How is it that what, what I'm doing right now is going to affect older people? How is it that whatever I am thinking about bringing forward right now will affect vulnerable people or people who may be already in an abusive situation? How will the work that I am doing on an everyday basis make space for a victim, help an abuser turn their lives around? So by asking these sort of structured questions that you can see in the roadmap and also in our supporting materials, by keeping that checklist with you, you're making sure that you're pushing all of the different work that you're doing and recording how it's affecting seniors and specifically how it's affecting the issue of abuse and neglect. I like a good table so that in my table, whatever it is that I'm thinking about always has a column asking the question about seniors broadly and asking about the roadmap in specifically. And I can bring that checklist to different meetings. We're going to make sure that you have that checklist available to you as one of the assets in our toolkit. So making change happen isn't so easy. Many of you will know it's a bit like pushing a rope. Every day, and in this place, I'll talk about decision makers. Decision makers wake up and they have an enormous amount on their plate. A lot of competing priorities. Right now, if you were in the federal government, as an example, you'd be thinking about the environmental impact, your economy, that business deal that you have with another country whether or not you can make sure that your military is ready, if there's going to be a war that comes on, you name it. There's a lot going on. So how is it that we push this particular issue around elder abuse and neglect and the roadmap forward to get into that most important category, the urgent and important? You'll see this, it's sometimes called the Eisenhower decision-making slide. What you're trying to do is not be in the orange section where you are less urgent and less important. You want to be moving upwards to the red area. When you're thinking about where you are in your day-to-day -day work, have a little map of where elder abuse and neglect issues are. And can you put them in something that has already got a train leaving the station? So let me make it practical. If, for instance, you're doing something on victim services, can you look at it with that seniors and abuse lens, that checklist, and see that you don't have anything on victim services for victims of elder abuse? Okay, let's push that upwards and try to make sure that we attach it. When we're talking about making something more urgent and more important, we're really looking for that very, very top left corner because there's lots of things that falls into that category, but we need to make sure that people are able to express the problem crisply and well so that we can make sure that we're making the case to any other decision makers or could be at a broader communications program. The first thing we need at your fingertips is the scope of the problem or getting other people up to speed as well. So you got to have the stats ready. You've got to make sure that you're clear on what your definitions mean. And do you have the same definitions as others? So sometimes what we'll see is on a policy making framework that you're saying we seniors and you're thinking about people who might be 80 plus, someone else is thinking about everybody 50 plus. That's a really basic example. You need to make sure that you're talking about the same thing. When you're talking about abuse, do you have an old list of abuse, which may only consider three or four different types of abuse? Or do you have the most modern and fulsome list that you'll see in the roadmap, which includes expanded thoughts and more recent ideas around what abuse and neglect is? There's some great resources coming out. You'll have the Practical Guide to Abuse and Neglect Second Edition. So if you need to figure out what the policy and legal landscapes are across this country, it's a great resource to look at. And you may decide to use that in a memorandum format or just frankly attach that document when you're sending it up to other decision makers. The next is being a bit strategic in getting up to speed. Who around you is passionate about this area? Has someone been public in social media or brought a bill forward if it's in government or sponsored something in the area of seniors or mental capacity or abuse? Is there somebody in your network, company, 
organization or government structure who you think could help to be a champion. Identify those people, map them out, and make sure that you're starting to include them and see if this is still an area of interest. Many people will have passion areas and are looking for an opportunity to move that forward. That championing is a really useful way. So let's identify some champions in your network, your communities, and your governments that can help. When you're thinking about putting that pitch together, think about what the sympathetic points are, what those headline issues are. And if you're talking about governments or communities or organizations or companies that are focused on not this work, but the, the broader world of selling things or making the economy go round, try to figure out where this would hit close to home. Is it that there was somebody at your business that was affected by abuse and neglect? Was someone scammed? Is it that you want to show that your local MP, that there's a very vast percentage of people who are exposed to a certain type of vulnerability in their area? Are there people who have shared their stories that you can lead with? I always, when I'm speaking to government or other decision makers, make sure that I'm bringing the voice of older people or people with lived experience, even if it's anonymized, to tell the story is the most important thing. Policymakers wake up and they have to figure out the way into other people who are decision makers if you are not the only person that gets to decide. And in doing so, think about who that is and what is most compelling to them. Help make sure that when you're looking at those facts and figures that you can tell a story quickly. Here's an example on ageism. So you'll see on the one side, we talk about what the definition of ageism is, and then a quick infographic with some facts about ageism in Canada. They've got some other click links that you can provide to policymakers and other decision makers that they could get more information. I always recommend having something like one slide that talks about the problem, one slide about the ask, and one slide about the impact. And really, that should be all that you need. Here's another example on prevalence. So it's a bit shocking. We can talk about the fact that people have experienced abuse in the last year. We could talk about the risk factors for abuse, and we could talk about who it was. Each of these is a way in, in terms of policy. If we're talking about people who are concerned because of risk, we can look at mental health professionals and the world of mental health, because we're talking about depression. If we're talking about abuse as a child or youth or an adult, now we have allies in the field. We want to make sure that we're bringing in a life course perspective to abuse, and there are allies there. We're looking at somebody who's financially dependent on you. Let's talk about financial literacy. Let's talk about other ways to protect ourselves. Let's talk about legal ways like powers of attorney that we might use or alliances with financial institutions. And we have a gender-based analysis who's part of this as well. In the last section, we talk about spouses, family members, friends, and neighbors. That is shocking. Most people are really set back when they are perceiving that the people who would ordinarily be closest to them are also the most likely to be abusers. So that brings in the understandings of different communities. That brings in a different opportunity for self-reflection around cultural or religious groups. Where do those folks come together that there may be a policy that supports an improved roadmap? So as an example, we've been working with different faith-based community and ethnocultural communities to be policymakers. They would not necessarily think of themselves as policymakers, but if they're able to preach or share information and say, you are a shared group, these are a shared set of concerns, we think that this is important and we're going to then espouse it, then that's a big impact for people. So again, don't forget that you may be a policymaker in a number of different aspects of your life, or that you may be a policymaker in one part of your life and have influence to others as well.
Here's another example. You might be talking about the current state of direct services and abuse and neglect. And this could be a very short conversation because we know that there are so few. So again, having some comparative data by telling folks, you know what, there really isn't anyone specifically to call that can help in all of these areas. And that the way that we are responding to them now is the most expensive way. People have no idea what they're going to get if they're trying to reach out. Will they get a police officer? If you call 911, will the fire trucks show up? You end up with a mental health response? It's very unclear. And lack of clarity means too many responders not knowing what to do or whose job it is. So an economic analysis is really important wherever we can. The last piece you might think about is making sure that you go into the conversation about risk management and risk analysis, a big point of governance for any organization. We know that people are not turning their minds from a governance point of view about what are the risks to the organization as well as to the individual. What is it going to mean in terms of liability or insurance? Find out what your audience is and what your audience is most concerned with. I may not bring, for instance, some emotional stories of people who've suffered abuse and neglect at the Treasury Department, but I would sure show them how an integrated system response is going to be more cost effective and require less downflow acute services. Know your audience and make sure that you are shaping that audience to this part of the roadmap. We need your policy pathways to include elder abuse. And that's going to mean things like finding those internal champions and making sure that the change management is on board, making sure that we're also talking about the different factors that we can map out within our organization that can integrate into it. Here's some practicalities. A couple of different strategies you could try. The first is what I call the motherhood at apple pie approach. You can try to get your organization, your government, your business to have a formal position against elder abuse. And why I say it's motherhood and apple pie is it's really hard to imagine somebody is for it, right? No one is going to say, yes, I think elder abuse is a good thing, right? It's not really a debatable issue. So getting someone to stand up and say, we are against elder abuse isn't very risky for them. In fact, it can be a nice political win. See if you can't then leverage that formal position around things like announceables. We've got World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, there's Seniors Day, there's Seniors Month, there's all kinds of community days. There's different organizations of older people or intergenerational communities. And you may have an opportunity for someone to say, we're going to give some money, we're going to announce a win, we're going to share that we are now buying in corporately, organizationally, or from a government perspective against elder abuse. So motherhood and apple buy. You can also expand and include. So have a look at a very practical level. Have you surveyed your existing processes and priorities? So let's have a look and see that you've got a strategic plan that's talking about a particular mandate. You are, for instance, going to ensure that you've got diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of your policies. Have a look at your diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. Is there something about age? Is there something about abuse? Can you add the word elder in front of a long list of other abuses that aren't allowed? Can you talk about discrimination and add the word age into the other forms of discrimination that are not allowed? Have you looked to see where, in a government level, mandates exist and try to find a way in? So this is what I call the vertical and the horizontal. So you can go in vertically and say, we're going to talk about abuse and maybe expand that from child and youth abuse and intimate partner abuse and domestic violence to include elder abuse. So we're coming in vertically on that. We can also look horizontally. Who else has a piece of this? Housing has a piece of this. Mental health has a piece of this. We can make sure that, you know, the issues around different forms of equity and social justice have a piece of this. 
And we can say at each of those levels, where is elder abuse and neglect? That's especially important when we're looking at things like diversity and inclusion, as I said. So you may be saying, look, you already have a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy, where is age? Or alternatively, you could be looking at our elder abuse strategy and saying, where is, for instance, the voice of LGBTQ plus people? Where is the voice of, of this ethnic group? Where is the voice of this particular Indigenous community? Look at it in all ways. In the end, just make sure that elder abuse, prevention and response, and in particular, this roadmap is integrated into it. Think about the issue of the day. Right now, I'm in a time where there is a war, there is a pandemic, there is a federal budget coming down. There's a number of different opportunities as well as distractions. Try to find the issue of the day and get your policy, this one particularly around elder abuse, neglect, and response into that. So for instance, if you were in a pandemic, what evidence do you have that elder abuse and neglect has been changed or amplified or worsened? Well, we gathered a bunch of that data over the course of the past two years. And I often lead off with the fact elder abuse prevention Ontario reported 250% increase in the first months of calls. Talk to police and police is saying that the reports are down. And then we have to ask why. In many cases, it was because people were locked up with their abusers. So find the issue of the day and then ask the question, how are seniors impacted? How is elder abuse and neglect part of this question? Let's look at another way. One of the issues of the day is long-term care. We know that we're thinking about different forms of elder abuse and neglect, but there's also a lot of conversations that are happening about long-term care. Make sure we're connecting and bringing those two things together. Make sure that your issue is top of mind and that you can bring it to every meeting, strategy, and framework that you're involved in. We're not starting from scratch. It's important that we map these things out. In a number of different topic areas, I will have a map of Canada and have like a green, amber and red, or some type of counting across the country. We are a federated country. And particularly when it comes to government levels, we need to make sure that we're asking the right type of question and the right type of request to the right level of government. So here's a quick mapping. But what I can tell you is governments, organizations, and communities are always looking out for what others are doing and why they're doing the way they want. So it's helpful if you have, for instance, one territory, in this case, you can see the Northwest Territory, with leadership. They've got a strategy, they've got a network, and they've got annualized funding. Now, if I'm going to go to the Yukon and Nunavut, who are also territories, I can say, look, neither of you have any of those strategies, networks, or annualized funding. Why not? Let's make some relationships and make some connections. If the Northwest Territories did it, we can too. Let's come from an asset support and a little bit of pressure to make sure that our friendly competition is in place. Then you can make those personal connections. Who do you know at the Northwest Territories that was actively involved in these pieces? And can you get them to be a champion for you in the other similar jurisdictions. Cost is key. And fundamentally, when you're getting down and out of the persuasive hearts and hearts and hands arguments to the actual paying for something, we really do need to understand what kind of investment we're asking for and have that costed out. You can see here that we've got a number, $9.5 million in annualized funding. So when you're going into a meeting, make sure you're leading after your hellos and why you're there with your ask. I am here to say that we are needing 
$8.5 million in annualized funding, which includes a $3 million core funding for the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse and $6.5 million for incentives to provincial and territory governments and go from there. Because when you're meeting with decision makers, you've got to get yourself up to that urgent and important, and they can't wait to the end to figure out when they're listening to your words, when is the other shoe going to drop? Lead with what it is you're looking for and then convince them why that's important. Start from where you are. I'm not saying you need to go and create a whole new strategy. Open up your government's mandate letter, your organization's principles and priorities. Make sure that you look at the values and the vision of the organization you're with. Have a look at your business and see if your diversity, equity, and inclusion covers this. Are you looking at child support because you need intergenerational supports? Start from where you are. You don't all need to be experts in this area to understand how important it is. But this roadmap will bring you up to a place in a space and give you the tools to move the policy needle forward. So what's on the wish list? We would like organizations, governments, regulators, and so forth to endorse the Future of Us roadmap. If you endorse it, again, motherhood and apple pie, you can say that it's important. You can get a quote from them. You can use those quotes to help in your persuasion of your next level of policy movement. So if you lead off with endorsements from organizations that are going to be key stakeholders to the one you're talking to, that really helps. So endorse. Adopt. We talk about a policy lens for elder abuse and seniors, then a checklist, a review, make sure that you're looking through those lenses when you're doing any of your work. So that's integrating this roadmap into the work that you are already doing. We know we need some investment. Now remember, investment isn't just that $9.5 million from the federal government and other amounts of money from provincial and territorial governments or municipal governments. It means time and attention. It means hearts and minds. It means that somebody has the ability to host an event and somebody else has the ability to fund it. Another organization has the ability to share information. So when you're thinking about investing, Yes, money, but also time, effort, and energy. We need to align. Right now, the elder abuse resourcing is a very small fraction of that of child, youth, and domestic abuse. This is not an either or situation and must not be put in competition. That's why expanding the definitions of things like lifelong abuse to include elder abuse first allows us then to go to the people who hold the coins, the treasury, the finance, the funding, and say, we've endorsed the roadmap, we've been reviewing our work with the policy lens, we've highlighted areas that we think are concerning, we believe that there should be investments in that expansion, and that investment shouldn't just be minimal, it should be aligned to the similar resourcing of child, youth, and domestic abuse as a marker and integrate. So this is where you do that really deep horizontal. Make sure that everywhere you go, top of mind, you're bringing this with you. It's always in your briefcase. So make sure that you put elder abuse and neglect into proactively mandate letters, diversity, equity, inclusion, HR policies, strategic plans, principles of equality. Take it with you and integrate it everywhere. Governments are partners and they do have an important role to play. But again, division of powers, we need to make sure we're asking the right things from the right level of government. Nothing stops a meeting faster than asking a federal government to do something that's provincial jurisdiction or asking a municipal government to bring down a big tax levy that is outside of their ability to do so. So here are a few examples of government as partners with a role to play. 
So for federal investments, we're thinking about things like getting elder abuse and neglect into the mandate letters. What that means is having meetings with the policy officers, the chiefs of staff, the communication officers, building up goodwill, making sure that in those stakeholder meetings, meetings with MPs or MLAs or MPPs or anyone else that you think of that has an opportunity to lean into getting those positions in government, that's going to be critical. Then you have to make sure that the money is going to be there. So figure out what your ask is and start lobbying for the budgeting. This could also be in a budget that you're looking for at your local community level. So it could be a giant federal budget, but for that matter, it could also be a local community one or a grant for communities that the federal government gives. So as an example, the federal government gives money to communities every year in the New Horizons for Seniors. We know that that's federal. We know it's going to happen. One of the ways you can do is push to have elder abuse as one of the areas of encouragement so that when they're going to be thinking about who they should fund, that's one of the key priority areas. So integrating those opportunities for this roadmap into those places and spaces allows for a shift, a change, an advancement without a lot of effort. We talked as well about the importance of seniors lens reportings, but also the importance here of cross government. So one of the things that we're talking about investments, one of the things investments that they can do quite easily is have somebody at each different area of government have a horizontal working group. We've had them on elder abuse before, but they have kind of fallen off the map. That's not that hard to get it reinvigorated. So asking for something like there should be meetings and there should be mappings and there should be reporting is not very hard. It's much easier than saying, I want to have $10 million. Make sure that you're asking the federal government for communication support. They can do that in-house and they reach a vast number of people. Ask them to get going on information gathering and data collection, StatsCan and others. Make sure we're asking them to cut that data up by different aspects. Right now, we often are getting 65 plus. We're not getting discrete data about things like younger people who are 65 to 70 versus older people who may be 90 to 95. So get your specific requests in there as well. And those can be things, again, that have huge impact, but don't cost a lot of money. There's also some federal areas that make a big difference. Justice, particularly when we're thinking about elder abuse and the intersection of the criminal code. Public safety, which is policing, making sure public health and the Public Health Agency of Canada's mandate around elder abuse as a public health issue is integrated. And let's not forget that Canada is involved in the conversations about having a UN Convention on the Rights of Persons uh, with Disabilities. They've already signed off on that and are now looking at the possibility of a UN Convention on the Rights of Older Persons. So go have a look at where we have already federally been and make sure that we integrate the roadmap at a tactical level in those conversations. With provincial and territorial investments, real keen requests to support lo local networks. That is so fundamental to that. Again, that seniors lens reporting is very helpful. Ask the provincial and territory governments about direct service development and making sure that pathways for reporting are integrated to avoid that very confusing and very expensive multi-sectoral response. Remember, when I mean that, I don't mean there's lots of good sectors doing good things. I mean, there's lots of people at crosshairs who have no idea what they're supposed to be doing and nothing really gets done well. They also have an important role in connecting local community efforts and raising those up to the provincial level. And then at a really tactical point, you're gonna have municipal uh, affairs involved. You're gonna have health and housing, the attorney general, policing and other areas. Those are gonna be very tactical to asking for great support in this roadmap from the provincial and territorial government. And last but not least, municipal investments. This is where people's lives are touched the most, and yet people often forget 
municipal investments and municipal supports. This is often very relationship based. It's very connected to service provision. It's also got an opportunity to connect at a very tactical and budgetary level. They can do some things like adopt an elder friendly lens or make sure that they're thinking about elder abuse and neglect as part of the age friendly system. If they want to go be age friendly and go through that certification as a local community, they need to make sure that they've got elder abuse protection, response, and awareness as part of that. Also, make sure that the municipal government can help to engage with diverse communities and make sure that their accountability, which is often quite tactical, has abuse and neglect of older people involved so that they're reporting back to local councils, reporting back to local communities. So we've gone all the way down to the very local level of policymaking. I want to have us lift our eyes up a bit as well. Don't forget, there are big initiatives that are already aligned with our work. We talked a bit about the Convention on the Rights of Older Persons, and certainly elder abuse and neglect is part of that. So reach out and maybe get involved in the conversations about this. If you are a policymaker, see what you can do to help push that forward. We know that right now, national long-term care strategies and standards are a big part of our conversation and will be so, I think, for at least for the next decade. Make sure that abuse and neglect are part of those conversations, have funding to support them, that are part of standards of practice, communities of care. We know that we are going to have difficult situations if we don't have enough staff. So find alignment around staffing with organizations that also care about that. Because one of the things we know is neglect will happen if there's not enough staff to help change people, feed people, take them to community events, make sure that they're activated or eating in a social environment. We need staff to make sure that we do that. So find areas where we can give back in alignment that help a bigger conversation. In this case, we would be a small piece of the conversation and inserting ourselves horizontally into that strategy. Same with dementia. We have a national dementia strategy. We know that people with cognitive impairment and specifically dementia have a greater risk of being abused and neglected as an older person. So make sure that when we're thinking about things like the dementia strategy or even making connections between cognitive impairment and elder abuse, that we're bringing those relationships together, that we are bringing top of mind our issues in this roadmap to every meeting strategy and framework, including these and some others that I'm sure that you're already involved with. I'm hoping today that you got something tactical out of how to move this agenda forward. You can always reach out to us. We have Benedict Chauflin, of course, and Margaret McPherson, who are leading this conversation with the roadmap. And I can be reached at Canage, and you'll see my information here below. We know that the reason why you're watching this and becoming engaged is that you are already passionate about policy change. I hope that this webinar gave you some ways to think about it both vertically and horizontally, to think about the top three asks, how to go into a meeting, and to think through what it is that you're really trying to get at, what the capabilities are, what the issues of the day are, and how, above all, to move your issue into that utmost top left corner of urgent and important, because elder abuse and neglect in Canada surely is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Join us today later at 2.30 p.m. Eastern for our next and last session with Krista James, National Director of the Canadian Centre for Elder Law. See you there.